Thank you for tuning in today. Today, CADSA presents our Transcend Athlete panel, where we will be hearing from two current and former trans and non-binary student athletes. The purpose of today's event is to center and celebrate Pride Month while exposing the heteropatriarchal norms that collegiate athletics and the ways in which that intersects with trans identity and experience as high performing student athletes affects these students here today. So this event also is meant to increase visibility and the ways student athletes are working to change the NCAA system from the inside out and to be more inclusive. My name is Michaela Adolphus, I'm the director of CADSA, the Coalition for African Diaspora Student Athletes, um, and I will be your host today. I'm super excited to introduce our two guests and we'll start out with Flo if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Flo, I use they them pronouns and I ran on the UC Davis track team for the last four years. Currently, I'm going to SDSU for therapy, um, and I'm going to become a sex therapist in the future, and I'm doing sex coaching and sex education currently. Thank you, Flo. And then I'll pass it off to Ziana. Hi, I'm Ziana. My pronouns are she, they, them, heavy on the they, them. I am a current brown women's rugby player studying environmental engineering and Africana studies. Um, hopefully, uh, I don't know where my career path is taking me, so we'll see where we go soon. I am currently in my final year. Thank you for sharing. Super excited to have you both here to talk and um, share your experience within athletics. Before we jump into our conversation with Flo and Ziana, I would like to um, set the stage and give some knowledge to you all who may not be familiar with the trans community. So we'll start out with some basic trans terms. First, um, just to explain, transgender does not have to do with sexuality. So transgender is about gender um, and sex, but not sexuality, not about who you are attracted to. So we will jump into what that definition actually is, which it is one's internal knowledge of gender being different than the conventional expectations based on that person's assigned sex at birth. It's important to talk about the assigned sex at birth because they didn't get to choose it. You were born and they said, Ooh, this is what you are because of the parts that you have. Um, but those who do decide to switch or transition, they have a few ways that they can transition. So if you are a male and you are transitioning to female, that's considered FTM or male to female transition, and then vice versa for females, so female to male. But it is not restricted to just the binary male and female. Some folks will transition to non-binary, gender queer, or gender fluid um, identities. And then on to the next thing that we will discuss is cisgender. So someone who's cisgender is someone who identifies with or fits the conventional expectation based on the person's assigned at sex birth. So if you were born a female and you identify and feel inside that you are a female, um, then therefore you are cisgender and the same for males. Um, and so some cisgender folk may still identify as they or them and may not consider themselves to be trans. So just to put it out there, there is no one size fits all for any of this. It's just important to understand what each person's identity is and to respect that. And then to move on to transition or transitioning. And so this is the process that one takes um, to live as the true gender that they feel they are. This does not always mean something invasive or physical or medical. So it may, may be a change of name um, going by a certain pronoun, wearing certain clothing, wearing their hair a certain type of way, or having surgery or taking hormones. It can be all of the above. It can be none of these. Um, it's just the way the person who is transitioning or considers themselves to be trans decides to carry out what they, what they believe they are. And then last we will cover is passing. So passing refers to a transgender person's experience of being viewed as the gender that they wish to be perceived as. Passing for some folks is important and is a good thing and they really want to pass. For others, it's not that important. So they may pass, they may not, they don't really care. And then to some it's negative. And the reason why they feel it's negative is because they feel it may be erasing the trans identity. And so being able to tell that someone is something different than what they um, were identified as birth is important to other folks. Um, and some don't really care as much. Again, it's about respecting what people want and how they wanna be perceived. So big on the respect here. We'll definitely talk about that throughout the conversation. And before we jump into the conversation, the last thing 
is I just want to talk about the importance of this conversation and being able to see and um, understand the experience as a trans person, especially in athletics. So we know within um, certain racial communities, the LGBTQIA plus people are stigmatized and that is for various reasons. Here at CADSA, we strive to support all student athletes, but specifically African-American diaspora student athletes. And we understand that in the African diaspora, there isn't a lot of acceptance of those trans folks, but they do co contribute to the society a lot um, within the LGBTQ community and outside of that. So it's really important for us to have this conversation to put them on a pedestal and say they're important too. do not just wash them to the side, do not just see them for their blackness, which lots of um, people are seen only for their racial identity. So see them for more than that. And so we also wanna talk about how the attacks on the black trans community has spiked in the recent years, especially in 2020, and it's still pretty high this year. Um, so it's really important for us to be able to talk about the things that they face, that way we can support those black trans folks and protect them. Next thing is disenfranchisement and then the lack of resources. So we see a lot of policies, not just around um, trans student athletes, but trans people in general, where they cannot get health care, they don't have financial support, they do not have the same rights as those cisgender folks. And so another reason why it's really important to have these conversations and to be able to see trans people. Um, and the last is there are currently 25 anti-transgender student athlete bills out in legislation right now that target youth and adult student athletes. And it's really important for us to talk about these issues and talk about why these legislations hurt our people because everything that we just talked about right here or that I've mentioned right here is an example of dehumanizing trans people. And we are human, we all deserve human rights and the same rights. It shouldn't matter how we wanna be um, identified. We all deserve the same respect and rights. And so that is why CADSA felt it was really important to have this conversation and to bring in those non-binary and trans student athletes to come and speak for themselves and to share their experience because we know like they're human people and we need to understand their human experience too. So with all of that said, we will jump into the conversation. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we can see your beautiful faces and start. So um, I will start out with the first question. First, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate you taking time out. Um, I would love to learn a little more about your experience as a student athlete. Um, so you can share you know, what sport you were on and your experience on that team. And I'll start with Flo. Awesome. So my experience was a little bit complicated. I think with anyone coming into collegiate athletics, it's already a lot to handle. Um, and to get used to, especially in your first years. But we did have a couple of tricky situations coming into athletics at our school. Um, not really the right support system. And going through my four years and realizing I was gender fluid and gender queer and like trying to accept that while all being in a very binary sport, it was really unhelpful to my identity. Um, and I think it really pushed off my self-learning and self-growing process. So overall, I think I got a lot of experience from it and learned a lot about myself, but there were times that I wish it were a little bit easier, but life is never that way. So <laughs> yeah, that was my experience. I thank you for sharing. And I definitely understand how sometimes athletics is not the healthiest place to grow as a person, especially if you don't fit those boxes or that framework that they try to put you in. So I definitely understand that. Um, and then Ziana, if you wanna share about your experience. Uh, yes, uh, so currently I am in my uh, final year of playing rugby at my university. And when I got there, I think it was like a really big culture sh shock, especially as like being gender, being gender fluid, being a masculine presenting uh, quote unquote female and things like that. And then being a black woman on a team full of cis white women who some were among like the spectrum, but it was, it, it felt very much, felt very alienating. Though I did have a very, like some very, uh, I did have some teammates who were very supportive. It was a lot of like, all of everybody was arm's length. Everybody was arm's length. 
um, and things just weren't working out as well as they should have. And very much like flow, it pushed off my self growth, uh, my self growth process a lot. I think, especially having a school who isn't very supportive in, in things like that, and just the only thing they can really offer is like therapy, and even that therapy is kind of uh, yeah. I definitely can understand that. Go ahead, Flo, sorry. Sorry, I definitely want to jump in there. I love to the point that you made about therapy being provided at school because a lot of the time they um, have certain therapies provided for student athletes in general. And I think that kind of erases your identity outside of student live out of outside of the athletics in general. So you go into it as like a black person, like of the African diaspora, queer on top of that. And you get there and they're like, for our school, at least it was three sessions and then you're referred out. You have to talk about all these things and put all of your identities out on the table for them to be like, well, I mean, we can talk about your mental health situation, but then refer you out like anything else. It's not really our business. Um, and yeah, very, very alienating. I think it would have been way more helpful to see those identities and create a space for it but alas it's not like that <laughs> yeah well I think it's really important to talk about creating those spaces um which I think now universities are kind of learning to help support their student athletes in creating those spaces um and some athletic departments don't have the they like to say they don't have the resources to be able to do this but really it just takes some time <laughs> really if they just had some time put some time towards it or, you know, reach out to a group who can help them. Reasons we started CADSA to help create those spaces. So it would be really nice to see um, schools invest in programs like Athlete Ally to create those spaces where you can see yourself, you can get support or at least connect with other people who are in the same position as you or identify the same way as you or similar to you. Awesome. Anything else you like to add, you all like to add to that that question or that conversation around athletics and um, your experience? Just because you mentioned it, I think my experience with Ath Athlete Ally at our school was amazing. I think finding that community through athletics was awesome because we didn't know it was there initially. Um, so. I think investing in things like that and bringing it into the school as a whole would really have changed my experience. And I like athletics really just needs to hop on that for all of the schools and different people. So, yeah. Yeah, no, um, I ended up going to a PWI. So um, just that whole space, that whole space. So I was just surrounded by just like cis white straight up. And a lot of people who were like, there's only the, there's only two genders, this and this, and just wishing that there was some kind of support system out there at my school. Like currently now as a senior, I'm still struggling to find these things. Like it got, it's getting to a point where like people, the people who are working in the school who are offering these things to students, like on their own time from their own pockets, we're ended up resigning and so it's like we're back to square one because all these things we built up all these people are leaving and so now it's like okay well what do we do now yeah most definitely and I think that's a really big issue too because oftentimes it's put on the individuals who are of the community rather than having it a system-wide thing so it was really awesome to have athlete ally at our school but it was put on all of the queer individuals who were athletes so we don't get that overall systemic support either. And on alone, we feel alienated when we have that community. As a community, we feel alienated because it's not system-wide. So I think that would make a huge difference as well. Yeah, there's definitely have to be buy-in from the athletic department, but also the university. And I think the athletic department understanding your student athletes are way more than just athletes, their whole beings, and then investing in their whole being and they get concerned because they're, well, that's going to take away from athletics. But no, all of your athletes would perform a thousand percent better if they felt supported and comfortable being themselves, being heard, could see themselves and knew that you actually cared. So I think it's very unfortunate that um, Brown has lost those resources and that those people who are willing to support on their own time 
but I think it is um, a good thing to talk about with other organizations and other programs, even other schools about how did you get this to happen? Um, as for myself, I also went to Davis with Flo. It was kind of part of that, I don't wanna say resurgence, but that creation of athletes outside of just athletics. And so um, Haven, who uh, is a now a trans person, she had started the Davis Athlete Ally and she did that on her own or they did that on their own. And they reached out to athletics and said, we need a space, we need something. And pretty much they said, well, you can do this. You can do this. We're not going to do it. You can do this and we'll give you someone who can support you outside of that or who's in athletics. But, you know, this has to be on you. So Flo, you make a good point that it, it gets put on those student athletes who identify to create that space for themselves. But there's power in that, in advocating for yourself and creating the space for yourself, because then it's your space and you get to decide what it's like. You protect that space, you protect those people in the space, instead of it being a space created by somebody on the outside and they're kind of doing guesswork. So there's pros and cons to it, but um, Ziana, I definitely wanna see how we can get some help to Brown. And that can be a conversation that we have. And we can talk to you about how Davis did their thing. And then if anyone watching would like to support Brown University or any school who's trying to create a space for their queer student athletes, just reach out to us. We'll have our um, contact information at the end of this. So to take the conversation to another space, I know you both talked about how athletics didn't really promote your ability to develop as a person. It hindered your growth. Um, just to go deeper into that, what do you think would have helped or what could they have done better other than creating a space for you, but what could have been better to help support you grow as a person outside of just athletics? And uh, Ziana, I don't know if you want to answer first. Oh yeah, no. Um, so I was a very rowdy, I was a very rowdy uh, girl as in like, I ended up getting arrested multiple times at my university, doing all these like things like acting out because I was not getting the help and the attention that I needed and things like that. I was fighting people. I was doing all of the things that I did in like, in my like low income, plus I'm low, low income first gen. So I was doing everything I was doing back in my hood, back home over at school. And athletics was like, I definitely found out very quickly. It was one of my like coping mechanisms. It was one of my things that like actually was supposed to help me. But when I stepped into a space, um, whether it was a um, metaphorical space or a physical space, and all I saw was like whiteness and white cisgender and only white gay women and only white bisexual women or anybody on the spectrum, it was like, my immediate thought was like, I cannot be friends with my oppressors. I cannot continually go to women who were not me, like who weren't who weren't black women, who weren't black queer women. And there weren't a lot of them. Um, there weren't a lot of them, at least in my circle. And if I did find them, I find them, I found them so late. Some of them had already, I had to go through other people to get to them. They had graduated in like 1990, 1994, 2015. My most recent one, my rock and everything, my Courtney, she graduated in 2019. And I was like, I am left here. Like I am like, this is it. And so that was one of like my biggest problems. One of my biggest things that I really think hindered me was that I could not for the life of me find somebody who was like that. And I always had to go through other people, do this and that, make left turns. And by the time that I needed, needed it, it was everything was all said and done. Yeah, building off of that, um, it was kind of the same experience. For me, we did have Athlete Ally, which was really, really helpful, but you can only do so much as athletes to like continuously meet up and create that space when you're on different teams. So within our team, especially now, because I did just like graduate and like leave off the team, um, there isn't anyone else who's gender fluid and who's black. And it's really dominated by white people. It's cross country moves over to track and that's like 90% of the team after all. Um, so there isn't that community, there isn't that safe space. And I found myself having to really fight for even my pronouns to be respected. Most of the people on the team never once used the correct pronouns for me, even after times of saying it over and over again. And it kind of just builds that like not safe space and like that icky feeling that you get. So after a while, I think it would have been really, really helpful to have that instated in the beginning, having that community and having 
people that are higher up that have authority really just instating that for you and like making sure that space is there and valid because when it's up to other people who like you said are your oppressors and are people who don't listen it's not going to get done and that safe space is not going to be created and we're going to keep coming into these spaces like years after each other and having the same issues so I think that's something that really hindered my ability to grow and like feel comfortable. Thank you both for sharing and being vulnerable in that moment. Um, I think it's apparent the big issue is that what you need, the support you need is not being upheld by those who have the power to bring it to you. And I think, um, Ziana, for you specifically, that a lot of that has to do with recruiting. A lot of that has to do with you know, networking and not connecting your student athletes to the right places, the right resources and other groups outside of athletics, outside of their team. I'm sure if you had that connection outside of just your team, you could definitely find people who looked like you identified as the same or similar to you or just understood your experience because they've been exposed to it. And so, you know, that's something that a call to action for anyone who's watching and within athletics in a higher up position you have to look for those student athletes who are different and figure out how to make them feel accepted and not different and not isolated, how to get folks on those teams and in the athletic department to respect them. Um, Flo, I know what you mean, <laughs> the respect level of pronouns or just who you are alone, it doesn't happen. And I mean, we think about we're kids on these teams. Yes, we're adults, but a lot of us still operate and think like kids, but athletics is supposed to be developing developing us say talk a lot about when they recruit you they tell your parents oh we're going to help them grow we're going to develop them even in their mission statements their goals are to develop their student athletes into functional and hardworking and contributing and good healthy adults and beings in the world but they're not doing that and where they fall short is supporting student athletes for the whole self and so I think it's a really good thing to hear from both of you that it's not a good thing that you went through it but it's good that people will be able to hear that you weren't supported outside of just playing your sport, being a rugby player, running track, and people didn't even respect you enough to address you how you wanted to be addressed or to understand that you are the only Black queer person on this team. Maybe we should be a little careful about how we talk to them, how we treat them, or think about, hey, I know somebody who you may connect with. Let me connect you instead of you having to go make a million turns and find someone. So I appreciate you all sharing that. Um, and then another, the last thing is that our coaches and athletic staff need training. They need cultural training because we can't expect them to know everything because they were only exposed to what they were exposed to, just like all of us. They need the training. They need the support. And so that's on the athletic department to put those coaches and athletic staff in the right position by training them and exposing them to the things that they couldn't have known about beforehand. Um, so anything else you all would like to add to any of that? No, I, I totally agree with that. I feel like in my experience is that, especially experiences with my coach, my coach, um, she's uh, she's very good about these things. Like my coach, um, I've noticed actually on campus is like one of the like coaches, like one of the very few coaches of color on campus. And um, I've noticed like, especially when she was talking to me about my recruiting process after I'd already gotten in and I had done all these things, she was like, it was hard. It's very, and she tells me all the time, it's very hard to get black, especially black athletes outside of like this whole like cisgender, like white, white circle, this, this whole thing. And sometimes it was all the fact that it wasn't her saying, no, I don't want this person. Like, I want this person. I want this person. It was the school. It was the athletics department going, no, no, you can't have this person. They can't, we can't let them in. And they would give some like, yes, answer to my coach or to any other coach and just make my coach's job just a tiny bit harder than it needed to be. It's definitely not okay. And it's unfortunate that universities and athletic departments are still discriminating against people, period and not looking at it. if you're so worried about being a good athletic program and having the best students and the best student athletes, then it shouldn't matter what they come with, who they are, where they came from, just get the best student athlete. Their grades are good and they, they can compete, get them there and then develop them, support them. That should be their main focus, but wanting to keep a certain image or be gatekeepers, that's not your job. And so that's really unfortunate to hear that that's what's going on there. 
Yeah, and just like to go back to that developmental point that you mentioned, it's like a selling point. They sell you on this development. They tell you, oh, we're going to bring in these people and whatever the level they're at, it doesn't matter. We're going to like grow everyone and all the athletes are going to be so much better when they come out. But you go into it already having to like bypass those obstacles that are put in front of you. Like you have to face that discrimination just to get in. And then when you get in and it's another level, it's another layer and you're developing like professionally maybe and kind of assimilating in a way because that's what they want you to do. But then in the end, you realize and you feel it and you overcome that feeling of, oh my gosh, this hindered me in so many other ways. I mean, this affected my identities in so many other ways. I may have gotten to a space where I graduated from a four-year university, but now I have to face all these mental health issues that weren't provided for and face all these like crises that you're dealing with your identities because you weren't given the space to talk about it and to flourish within your actual true and authentic self. Those are amazing points, Flo. And I really like how you put growing into your true authentic self because at the end of the day, that's the most important. You're not gonna play sports for the rest of your life forever or most people won't. <laughs> you're not gonna be a student for the rest of your life or at least most people won't. You're gonna be yourself for the rest of your life though. And so, yeah, they definitely need to improve um, the climate within athletics when it comes to growing and you know helping your student athletes grow <laughs> into their authentic self. So that's a perfect way to, to put that. And so then we'll jump into the next um, point. And I know that we talked about in the beginning, or I mentioned how an erasure of trans people was happening and we, we don't feel seen. Flo, you shared how you did not feel seen. You were not, your pronouns were not respected. Um, and so for trans and non-binary folks in general, if you don't have a specific moment where someone helped made you feel seen, what advice would you give to those who are not within the trans community and are not non-binary? How can they help make folks like all of ourselves feel more seen? Uh, Flo, I don't know if you want to start off. Sure. I think this is super tricky because there's so much information out there and I don't want to kind of like reinvent the wheel. But for me, what I think about first when it comes to giving advice and answering this question is respecting people's pronouns and also calling your friends out when they don't. I see so much of like being like, even just in my experience, I'll be in a circle and one person will use my pronouns and the other person won't. And it's like, we all know what's going on, but I have to be the one to continuously like defend myself and like defend my pronouns. I think it gets tiring, it's draining. I don't want to have to like validate my own identity over and over and over again. I want other people to do that as well and realize and see me for who I am. So I think that's one thing. And also just having the space built in in athletics. I think coming in, not assuming that all your athletes are going to be cis. Regardless, like there may be a lot of bills and stuff that are going on that erase our identities and maybe prevent us from coming to these spaces. But assuming adds another layer. It does another prevention tactic. It's like, I want the coaches to step out of their comfort zones and be like, hey, let's discuss pronouns. Like, what is everyone's pronouns? Or what name do you want to go by? Anything as easy as that, just implementing simple steps to like really make everyone feel comfortable. No, to definitely build off of Flo's point, um, just be intentional. Be intentional about what you're doing and don't don't make it seem like a big deal. Like, oh, this person is in cis. Oh, these are, they don't have the same pronouns. Like, shut up, shut up. Be intentional about it, make an effort. Because at the end of the day, that little small effort you made makes me feel so much better. Like I very recently changed my pronouns. So this wasn't like about a year ago um, after I was sitting here, um, just grappling with this idea of like, am I like really like she, her, am I? am I this, that? And like, after realizing that very much so that I was not, uh, that I wasn't like 
wasn't exact quote unquote male, I was like, all right, cool. Like they, them, this is what I'm going to settle on. And like only very recently, like uh, I can count it on my, on my, on my fake wristwatch, like three months ago, people finally started using my they, them pronouns after I had told them, Hey, it's she, they, them, but heavy on the, they, them, like make an effort to call me, they, them. And it got to a point where I was like, I'll just stop speaking to you because if you truly, if you tell me you value me and you truly want me in your life, then you better make it intentional and you better make an effort to use these pronouns for me and to make a space for me because at the end of the day it's not always going to consistently be my job to make a space for for my like for myself and other uh, athletes who are not cisgender and who are not a part of the uh, norm i yes yes <laughs> go ahead Flo. that was just so many things that you said I related to. I I don't want to cut people off. I don't want to unfriend people from my life. That me meant something to me before I transitioned and like before I used my pronouns. But now that I've like realized who I am and I'm accepting my person and I want my friends to, when you don't respect me, that's just like taking off a box. I'm waiting for you to like make the move and really transition, like try, put intention behind it, put intention behind your words and be there for me. And if you're not, it's like, how much longer can I go straining myself and harming myself to accept that you won't make a change either? You know, and it's just like, at the end of the day, if you can't do something as simple as transitioning how you talk about me, moving the pronouns around, then it's like, when it comes to bigger things, when I'm fighting for my life on the streets, when I'm fighting for the respect that I deserve in athletics, who's going to be there for me? I don't want people around me that can't even use the pronouns for me. So it's like, at the end of the day, it's pick and choose because I'm not going to have people around me that can't simply change pronouns. Those are big points, both of you. Great advice, but even bigger, the bigger message is just respect people. And I will say I spoke myself and I am definitely it's interesting um Ziana how you talk about you just change your pronouns she they them but heavy on the they them I love the heavy on the they them that is something that I'm definitely going to take from you because <laughs> I don't do that I'm like it's she they it's whatever but choose what you want but really heavy on the they them because it's both and it's both for a reason respect that and flow it's super big for the people around you to respect that I I 100% agree with that because okay, it's so easy for you to just acknowledge it's they, them. And maybe you slip up, cool. You acknowledge you slipped up, fix it after that. I slip up all the time. It's it's a force of habit. You've been used to me or someone else being a certain pronoun. That's what you've called them all your life. And now you got to switch it. Okay, still do the work. If you care about me, you'll do the work. But I can't trust that you're going to support me or be there for me when things get big. This is a thin situation. <laughs> this is not even that big. It's just how you address me. If somebody comes at me, am I going to know you have my back? Are you going to protect me? Are you going to support me when someone we both are connected to is challenging me and who I am? I, I wouldn't trust that. So yeah, I would definitely understand why both Flo and um, Ziana, why you all are choosy about you keep around depending on how they respect you and your pronouns and who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's like the crucial difference too. It's not just using your correct pronouns. It's acknowledging them. And when you make a mistake, that's fine. Like the difference between making a mistake and actually implementing using the correct pronouns for people are huge. There's like a huge difference. You can make a mistake, correct yourself, keep moving, and it's fine. I'm not going to hold that against you. If you go, oh, she, and then you're like, wait, they, sorry, and move on, don't make a big deal out of it, I'm going to continue like normal. That is not going to count against you. That's not going to do anything. That's not problematic. I see everyone working, and I'm working myself to not have these like, heteronormative norms in my head, right? So I expect everyone else to do the same. But if you're consistently not doing it, if you haven't even tried, then that's the real issue. I see you not putting intention behind it. I see you not protecting my identity and I don't feel safe around you. That's the real difference. It's literally a choice. It's a mistake between a mistake and a choice. Are you choosing to not respect me and my pronouns and who I am? Or is it just a mistake? You're human, it happens. So definitely things you have to differentiate between and decide who is doing what. Um, and then one way to just bring this back to something more relatable, say you, um, 
So you just change your name. You change your last name. You got married, you changed your last name and you used to be Mrs. Jones and now you're Mrs. Harper. But everybody, or you used to be Miss Jones and now you're Mrs. Harper. And your family only calls you Miss Jones. I mean, I who got married, <laughs> changed my name. You were at the wedding. You know that my name is now Harper. Why can't you respect that? Oh, you forgot? That's fine. Now call me Har Mrs. Harper, not Miss Jones. It's literally the same thing. It's just respecting people and what they want to be addressed as who they are. I am now Miss Harper. I am not Miss Jones. So it's it's that easy. It's just a name change. It's just an identity change. And more than that, it's showing that you see me because I'm not whoever you're addressing from the past anymore. I am who I am now. And so people need to realize it's, it's respecting who you are and seeing you for who you are. So any other advice or any other moments when someone has made you feel seen? Okay, cool. So um, last thing I can just share that outside of athletics, I've never had it in athletics where someone was who addressed me as they or even respected the fact of who I am. Um, but in the working world, in the space that I work in now, I have coworkers who will make sure that they say my name correctly, correctly, like Mikaela, not Mikaela. I have people who will make sure they use they from, from time to time. They don't always just say she. And I think it's very interesting to see that these adults who barely know me, they've known me for like five months, are able to adjust to who I am and put that extra work in to say the right things. And so just to think about those people that you're around day to day and you've known them for so long, you spend hours with them at practice, study hall, class. You're gonna spend all this time with them. You can respect them. You can do a little extra work when you're gonna see them every single day for 90% of the day. Um, so that's just a push for those who are watching to you know, respect and support those people around you. They are your family, they are your teammates, treat them that way. And so then our last point, um, and we'll wrap it up after this point, is knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently to prepare yourself for collegiate athletic, for your collegiate athletic experience? Um, knowing like who you are now, everything that's gone on in the past, things that you let go by and things you did challenge. Is there anything you would have done differently? Um, and then if there's nothing that you would have done differently, is there any advice for those who are either questioning if they're trans or um, gender fluid um, or non-binary or advice for those who currently are trans and in the space or non-binary in the space? So either one of those questions, you can answer both of the questions. And we'll start with Ziana. Uh, yes, so I think what I would have done differently, I would have, I would have stepped away from, I would have stepped away from my team, just in general, because I was one of four black women on the squad as a freshman, and one of them was uh, on the spectrum or genderqueer, which was uh, Courtney. Um, and I was attached to her. I was, I was basically her laptop, like lap dog. Like I, if she went somewhere, I went somewhere because she was the only person in that space that I saw myself in. And she always, she always told me, and I didn't listen to her for a while. She said, get like off of this team, like go find other black people in these other black spaces. Cause they exist on campus. They're very far and in between, but they exist. And she said, go and find them, go and find them. And it wasn't until she left was when I finally said, all right, I will go and find them. And eventually, it took some time. I didn't find them until my right here, senior year, but it took some time. So what I wish I would have done differently was like leave a team, leave the team that was just predominantly like cis and white and all this crap. I think honestly, that's really relatable. I think after mix year, a lot of people left that I identified with. And I didn't have that community on the team anymore. We had created our own safe space and I can relate to you in the lapdog version. I was always with Mick wherever they went. And that was like, we went to pride and stuff like that. Like we held that community, but after Mick left, it kind of just like fell and having to go outside of that. Like at least I had the black community that I went to but finding queer people within the black community is hard on its own. So. Definitely any, the advice to give would be find your community before if you can or when you're coming in because those people are gonna be with you for the next four years, hopefully, and it's gonna be crucial. You will go everywhere together. You will do everything and you will feel safe with them. And that is what's gonna give you 
the college experience that you deserve. Those are definitely relatable points. Finding your community is a big thing and getting outside of just the athletic space because you're more than an athlete, you are. And unfortunately, athletics can't guarantee that they're gonna have someone who looks like you, is like you, all of those things that you can relate to. They can't because it's luck of a draw, whoever they recruit and whoever comes. But in the university, universities are huge. There's definitely people that you can connect with. There's definitely a community out there for you. They just not, might not be athletes. And that's something you'll teach them about. You'll teach them about how it is to be this person plus intersecting with the athletic identity. And they will most likely support the heck out of you because you're different and that's fine to them. So definitely um, appreciate what you all shared about stepping outside of that athletic space and finding people um, and definitely understand how it feels to be someone's lap dog because they are the only person who you identify with. Um, Flo knows, Ro, I was definitely their lap dog. I was with them 24 seven. The only difference for me was I was just really aggressive about finding myself because I had gone through a lot in that space. And so I forced myself outside of that zone. But for a lot of student athletes, that's too much. You have a lot going on and not everybody has the capacity to go and search for those people too. So yes, definitely flow, sharing, go and find that community as you come into college right away. But also just bringing it back to the university, bringing it back to the athletic department, help your student athletes connect with people outside of athletics, help your student athletes find themselves outside of athletics. I know it's a scary thing for athletic departments and coaches to think you're going to go to what meeting for how long you have class, you have practice, you have these things, but I, they will perform better. They will be better people. They will contribute to your program a lot better if they're able to grow and express themselves and have that community outside of athletics. So just going to continue to push that because that is honestly the, the best way and one of the only ways athletics will truly be able to support their student athletes wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly is to connect them outside of athletics. So. And then before we wrap up, any parting things that you all would like to share, any parting words, um, anything you would like to urge to anyone? Honestly, not only find your community in the school, but find it outside of school too. I think that's really big, like go to events, go to pride, go to things that are going to connect with you outside of academics. Because after those four years are up, you're going to have to face people in the real world. And honestly, it's way harder to find your community after you graduated. It's so hard, especially with COVID. Like in this time, it's so much harder to find a community virtually. But if you do that, if you take those steps in college and then you graduate and you're still taking those steps, everything will be so much easier. You'll find your friends, you'll find your forever people. And that's what really matters. Yep, find your people outside of school. Also, make sure you find your worth outside of your sport. Do not attach your attach your worth, especially as someone who is non-conforming. Do not attach your worth to your sport. Attach your worth to how much you've grown and who you are and how true you stay to yourself. I love all of that. Those are beautiful statements to end with. I appreciate both of you for giving your time today and just sharing your experience, your thoughts, your advice, and all of that. I know it is going to help a lot of people. Um, we may not know that we helped a lot of people, but someone will see this and hear what they needed to hear. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ziana. Thank you, Flo. I really appreciate you all. And then thank you to everybody else who is viewing this. If you do have any questions or you want to reach out to anyone on this um, podcast today, you can definitely reach out to myself. Our contact information will come up after we hop off of here today. And then you can always reach out to any of us on Instagram or through our website or our email. And all of that will be linked in the next slide. So thank you again. Hope you all have a great day. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Learn something about someone within the community and spread love.